is a good one, mate. <laughs> we hook it and cook it on this episode of Fishy Business as we head off to catch a feed for a cook-up. Darren shares some great tips on finding, catching and cooking crays. Look at this here, that reeks of crayfish. Kirk takes some simple seafood and shows us how to turn it into some delicious delights. With a blustery Auckland day, our fishing is restricted to the sheltered waters around Rangitoto Island. Hi, welcome to Rod and Reel Fishy Business. Well, today I'm out with my good mate Mark Kitteridge from New Zealand Fishing News, who's on his holidays. So I said to him, hey Mark, let's go out for lunch. But I said, there's one catch. We've got to catch our lunch first. You've made it a bit of a challenge. We've got sow easters. And it was pretty cold this morning, so I'll be interested to see what happens with the fish. But um, yeah, that's what I like. I like, like a bit of a challenge, so let's have a good go. I bet I get the first one. <laughs> Double hook up. Always happens, fish breeds fish. But I think mine's not very big. <laughs> oh, little panny. Oh, yeah. Now we've got to let him go before the shag goes. There you go. He'll definitely crank the 30. So yeah, he's a good 35. That'll make a nice lunchtime fish, I'd say, Mark. Oh. It feels like it might be suitable for dinner. Oh! Oh, that's better. Oh, well done! Oh. <laughs> I don't want to put Mark under too much pressure, though. Damn, that was a good fish. <laughs> On the verge of being a legal fish. Grab that lure beautifully. Nice. And we'll just um, measure them up here. The legal limit's 30, so I've got a measure here. And it's very important that when you're measuring a fish, it's to the V of the tail, not the end of the tail. A lot of people get caught out. So the V is that part there, not there. So 30 centimetres. And that one scrapes in at about 33. With only average fish at our first spot, Mark suggested we try a spot that had fired for him in the past. We set the sea anchor to slow down our drift as the wind was picking up. Well, I don't know if it was the drogue or just my good luck, but uh, I've managed to get my hooks into a fish that's uh, probably going to be my best one today so far. <laughs> nice to hear the line going out. Mark. Yeah, it is. But that is challenging conditions today. You know, you've, it doesn't matter where you fish, if you fish offshore, you fish inshore, you know, you've got to try and work out what your line's doing, what your lure's doing, to give yourself the best opportunity to put your bait in front of a fish. Doesn't matter if it's a bait or a lure. You think you've got like a five, five, six, like a five or six pounder and it comes up and it's only three or four. Yeah, you're swimming up current, which is a good sign. Oh yeah, this is a quality oh, fish. Nice fish, mate. Quality fish. Very nice. Hey. I might even just, just as a, a net, mate. Would you like me to do it? Oh, I'm good, I'll just lead him in. He seems well hooked, but better safe than sorry. Awesome. Oh, that's, yeah, that's a nice fish. Yeah, that's, that's a great fish to be catching in the Auckland Harbour. Each time we drifted off Mark's secret spot, we repositioned and set the drogue. This was made easy by following the track on our Simrad GPS. Okay, Mark, that Ooh. looks all right. Yeah, it's all right, mate. I'll show you drifting over the same spot again, eh? Yep. Yeah, just persistence on days like this, isn't it? Keeping your line in the water. Yeah, well, this, this is, you know, this is where the real fishing skill comes out, you know. When they're easy, you know, they, they pretty much everyone gets them, but when they're hard, it's when, you know, the real angling skills show out. <laughs> That's what I tell everyone. <laughs> oh, I do love it, though, when you've worked it, man. You've got the drag singing and Rod's hard over. Such a strong current, just everything gives a really good account of themselves. And 
catching fish on these. Yeah, light. Oh, yeah, I'm on two. Oh, this is a good Ooh. one, too. <laughs> this is a nice one. <laughs> Double hooker. Oh, it fell off. Oh, no. Oh, that was a good that fish, was too. It was screaming. Yeah. All right. And that is what makes... That's a nice... That's what Rangi Toto is so good about. Man, that is that's nice, a beautiful fish, nice fat fish. Grab that lure beautiful. nicely too. Yep. But yeah, and, oh, yours would have been probably oh. even bigger, but yeah, that's, that's a story, that's fishing, isn't it? <laughs> I, was, I was too busy talking up our skills. <laughs> As you may have well uh, found out, Mark and I have a very, very friendly rivalry when it comes to fishing. <laughs> but it keeps you going. It and does. It, and it, uh, yeah, let you overcome a few things sometimes. And I must say, he normally, I think he's got the odds on me, he normally cleans me up. Oh, here he comes, Mark. I love to see that red glow. Yeah. Another, another nice quality fish. Yeah, we've only caught three around the side, but they've all been great. Good, good quality fish. Yeah. Here's the net again. There we go. Oh, that was a good one, mate. <laughs> <laughs> this could be a goer, mate. <laughs> Whoa. Don't you love it when they oh, pull out mate, that line? Awesome. Whoa, that one just smoked away, mate. Lead him into the net for you. Whack him up on the gunnels there, Mark. Good on you, mate. Well done. Thank you. With enough fish for lunch and dinner, we headed for a bit of shelter close to the lava flows off Rangitoto. The two smaller fish there, we've had them on ice since we caught them this morning and they've set. So the deal is, I'll cook lunch if you can fill it, but I also want you to scale the fish because I want you to cook, scaling? I want to cook Scaling? Scaling, we don't no. do it very often. No! Yes, cooking a piece of snapper with the skin on, on the boat, is the best way to do it. So here you go, mate. You do the honours. OK, mate, well, I'll put up with it for you because I know that there's usually a good uh, method to your madness. <laughs> To scale a fish, use the back of a strong knife and scrape the scales from the tail towards the head. Okay. Remember to patch your fish dry and season your fish with salt. Put small slices across the fillets to aid getting even cooking and crispy skin. Boneless fillet, skin on. Adam's hopefully going to be happy. I'd brought some pre-cooked spuds to make chips. So our nice crunchy chips are just about ready. The real key to cooking a good piece of fish is how you treat your pan. First of all, you've got to heat your pan without the oil in it, especially on a boat, to bring it up to temperature. And then when it's up to temperature, then you heat your oil secondly, so the oil doesn't get over hot and burn your food straight away, but you want it to be hot. So heat your pan good three, four minutes before you start cooking, then put your oil in. Put your fish in and hold it down for 20 seconds, and then don't touch it, whatever you do. Because you want that skin to crisp up. And don't overcrowd your pan. Three or four pieces maximum. I'll leave it up to the chef. <laughs> Flip it over. Oh, look at that. Absolutely crunchy, golden brown, and perfect. Just give it a minute or so on the other side, then it's ready to serve. I've made a salsa verde, which is basically herbs, a little bit of anchovy and garlic, lemon juice and olive oil, and we just dress a little bit of that on the fish to give it that citrus and salt. And that's Mark's fish of the day. Here we go, mate. That is spectacular. Thank you so much. Made it really worthwhile. And it's all just on our doorstep. Check out the Fishy Business Facebook page for all the recipes. Coming up, Darren shows how to find crayfish and the best ways to prepare your catch. Look at this here, that reeks of crayfish. Rock structure above water can tell you a lot about what's underwater. Right, so you're looking for coast to find snapper and crayfish. So behind me here we've got nice rocky uh, face and below it you can see there's boulders and rocks and things. There's a really nice rock shelf here. 
And so that's the sort of area you want to look for uh, to find snapper hiding behind it. There's big boulders on the bottom. There'd be crays underneath the boulders. You know, if it's just crays you're after, big boulders, big round boulders. Look at this here, that reeks of crayfish. And the big boulders off to the right of it, absolutely perfect. So real nice rocky coastline, not the dead flat stuff. Often there's nothing there, it's just flat underwater as well. If you learn to understand where crayfish live, it becomes easy to skim over the bottom until you recognise exactly the type of territory that crayfish live in. This big cray was facing females. He's trying to impress them. Big mistake, he's heading to my freezer. So this guy here is as big a red cray as you generally will ever get anywhere. Now you can see that that's 3.9 kilos. All right, 3.93 kilos. Now that was caught by Simon, who's behind me somewhere, around us, right up in the shallows, in a few metres of water. You'll see him catch it when you're watching this. So, have a look at that. That's a true three, three to four kilo red cray. Note how this guy's situated himself in the corner with a slight overhang above him. Not bad, but when a gun like Simon Brebner decides he wants to catch him, the cover's not good enough. Keep them away from your body. They'll grab anything they can latch onto. Vertical cracks like this craze in is sometimes very hard to catch as the crevice can be deep behind them. This big boy has a deep boulder to hide under. You have to attack fast, otherwise he's gone. Filming and catching has its moments. I need a second to get the better of this guy, as he's got a really good grip on me. Sometimes you've got to grab a cray any way you can, but best practice is underneath the horns. That's better, those big legs are the best. Now one of the things is about going out diving and catching seafood, crayfish, fish and things like that, is how do you prepare them, how do you cook them? Now there's all sorts of different theories on, on the length of time. A smaller, just over legal cray like that, I like to do it for around about 10 minutes, and that's 10 minutes from the boil, so boil the water and then drop it in. That one there, 11 to 12 minutes, slightly bigger, then you get into like a kilo cray like that, I'm sort of thinking around about 12 minutes, and then you get into the bigger pack horse cray and some of the big two, three kilo red crays, I reckon 15 minutes from the boil. I like to cook them in salt water, so when I'm diving I bring home a bucket. I take a bucket out in the boat with me with some uh, empty, obviously fill it up with good clean salt water from way out wide where I'm diving, and bring it home and cook them in that. Okay, so water's boiling, so set the timer on my watch, um, and we'll get cooking. So they're both in, they're big, it's windy, so the flame on the barbecue is probably not as strong as what it should be under the um, pot. So I'll probably give them definitely close to 15 minutes, those two big crays. One of the utensils I quite like to get them out, especially if I'm going to keep cooking in the same water, pair of tongs. The lid off, I don't need them because this one, well, I sort of do, still got, look at that, beautifully cooked. Okay, and then the big red cray. Nicely cooked. Now that's all sitting there ready to go. Now I like to let them sit for a while. You let them sit and cool down and they continue to cook a little bit if they're not cooked, but just leave them like that for um, maybe, you know, half an hour they can sit and they'll be ready. I miss the best part, the big legs, the big claws I've cooked. We've got to get those out. Not about those. These unfortunately pulled off the last catch, you know. Now, in my smaller crows. As I say, about 10 minutes for those and that should be plenty. That's the cooking part. Now there's, how do we eat it? I get an old knife, don't get your best filleting knife, and stick my knife in and down and slice them right through the middle. Oh, they smell good. And 
again, it looks really nicely cocked. Just a little bit more of a go with your knife. Beautiful. Now you can clean that part out if you don't like that part. It's quite nice, you can pull out the little bits and pieces you don't want, but crayfish ready to eat. It looks very, very yummy. Being a cook, I might just keep this lead for myself. If you're wondering how to kill crayfish, I'd actually frozen these for 24 hours. So it just puts them off to sleep quietly. It's probably the most humane way to do it. Frozen, then pulled out, thawed in the pot. Mm. Don't get much better than crayfish. Coming up, Kirk takes some family time catching cockles in Kahawai and turns it into a mouth-watering meal. I'm heading out today in search of some cockles. We're having a bit of a cook-up, so I've got Lucy on the back, and we're gonna head out in the Whangapoa Harbour at low tide. Just gonna park up on a little sand spit and dig for some cockles, see what else we can find. The run to the cockle bed only takes a couple of minutes, and as they are so easy to find, it's the perfect activity to do with the kids. Shellfish attract a number of different predators, from the birds at low tide to the various fish species at high tide. The cockles, or kiwi clams as they are sometimes called, are situated just a few centimetres under the sand. If you don't find any straight away, moving just a few metres can see you pulling them out by the handful. It didn't take Lucy and I long, and we had plenty in the bucket for a meal. When collecting cockles, you must be aware of your limits. We were allowed 50 each, so before leaving we did a quick count up to check we were within our limits. With the cockles sorted, I took my son Blake for a quick fish, a little further down the harbour to add some kawai to the menu. There are lots of different ways to fillet a fish, but I'm going to show you the way that, that I do it. doesn't mean it's the best way, this is just the way that I find it the easiest. So I'm going to start by putting a cut behind its front fin there, behind its gills. It goes in there like that, just down, just lightly over its gut cavity, spin it around, and then I come down, I'm going to cut in here, in the top, and then run down the, the uh, the back, basically, the backbone of the fish. So I pull that fillet back there, and this is the gut cavity here, the bones, and I just run the knife just down above them. I can just feel it underneath the knife, and the fillet just comes away without cutting any of those guts. And that gives you a nice clean fillet, and that's important because we're eating this fish raw, we don't want any of the um, juices from the stomach. All right, so you can see this line here. This is where the bones are. So I just run the knife on one side of them, and I can feel they come down to about here. Knife on one side of them, all the way down to the skin, and then the same at the other end. And that then creates this nice little line. So, we don't have to do anything more with it. Now we're going to spin it round and skin it. So grab the end, knife in, just nice and gently, and then push it along against the skin. You don't have to worry too much if you don't get all the fish, all the flesh off the skin, because we're going to be cutting some of that off anyway, because the kawai can be quite a red meat. Okay, that's the bit we cut out, and there is our nice, fresh fillet. Okay, we've got the uh, kawai out of the fridge now, it's been in there a good 12, 14 hours, so it's nice and ready for the sashimi. We're also going to be cooking some cockles in some spaghetti, some of those cockles that we got. I'll pick some of the bigger ones out and I'll get a dish of that on the go. But we'll start with the 
with the car wire and I'll show you how to prepare it. With a nice sharp knife we want to slice the bloodline off the flesh, almost as if I'm skinning it. The red meat is very strong tasting so that's why I remove it. So I'll just run that under there. Almost like filleting it. The fillet is then sliced into two to three millimetre thick pieces, which is how I prefer them. This gives a perfect bite size and a great texture. Remember to use Japanese dipping soy sauce rather than Chinese soy sauce. And then the wasabi, just run a line of it alongside. With the sashimi back in the fridge, it was time to get the spaghetti and cockles on the go. The idea is to add butter, extra virgin olive oil, garlic, and sliced chilies into a pan, and then add the cockles. And some white wine. With the lid on the pan, the cockles will steam to cook in just a couple of minutes. You know they are ready when the shells are just starting to open. To complete the meal, some freshly chopped Italian flat leaf parsley is added to the spaghetti and stirred through. The stirring process is important to ensure that the pasta takes on those delicious flavours that the cockles have been sitting in. With plenty of hungry guests to feed, everyone dug in to enjoy this fresh seafood feast and even the harshest critics were satisfied. Fishy Business is proud to support Legacy.